All right. It seems like um, pretty much is, everybody is here. So you can keep introducing yourself in the chat. Um, and we're going to go ahead and get started um, with the event. Um, so the first um, thing that we um, you know, want to do is a land acknowledgement. So um, Brianne, if you don't mind. Um, so um, you know, here at, at UC Berkeley, um, we recognize that the University of California Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, um, which is the ancestral and unceded lands of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone peoples, um, who are the successors of the sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. So this land um, was and continues to be of great importance to the Mwakma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona band. Um, so um, we find that it's really important to um, acknowledge and call out um, whose land we're on um, and for a, a many different reasons. Um, and if you are in the Bay Area um, or anywhere else, one great resource to find out whose land you may be on is to go to um, uh, that link down there, which is native-land.ca. Um, and we know that land acknowledgements are only a first step um, in terms of creating social justice and um, really uh, challenge ourselves and everybody to think about what kind of actions that we can take also to um, support Indigenous communities wherever we may be. Um, so that's, um, we find that as something really important to kind of ground um, all the work that we do. Um, and then, so we're going to move into some questions about you. Um, so um, if everybody can take out their phones, um, and you can even, I think, do this on a browser if you want to do it on a separate window. Um, but take out your phone and you can follow that um, QR code um, or go to pollev.com slash alex1824. We have some interactive questions to get to know you a little bit. Oh, and to back up, sorry, I didn't even introduce myself and my co-facilitator. So my name is Alex Tan and I'm the program coordinator for our Berkeley Summer Abroad programs. Um, we have a bunch of uh, programs that are led by Berkeley faculty where you travel in a group of students with a Berkeley professor um, to, to uh, a broad location to study in depth in a specific topic. So those are the programs I coordinate. We'll talk a little bit more about all the programs we have um, and I'll pass it off to my co-facilitator, the amazing Brianne um, to introduce yourself as well. Hi folks, my name is Brianne. Uh, I am the Global Internships Program Coordinator. I'm excited to be teaming up with Alex on this, uh, on this presentation for you all today. Fun fact, Alex and I actually met several years ago on our own study abroad program, um, which I think for me personally really planted the early seeds of my social and political um, consciousness by pulling me out of my immediate environment and really um, forcing me to, to confront my identities, um, my privileges, and um, we're excited to present these opportunities to you all. Um, as ways to, to start to um, think about your, your positionality in the world as well. Um, in my full-time role, I uh, coordinate our Global Internships Program, which is a, a, a program for Berkeley students to be able to spend a summer abroad um, interning for a company um, or organization within their career goal and sector, um, and also um, earn academic credit at the same time. Um, we'll go more into those programs later on throughout the presentation, but we'll start off with this uh, fun getting to know you activity. All right. So the first question is, which of the following describes you best? Free to enter on your phone and see. Looks like most of the folks are first year students. Awesome. Well, given this is an undergraduate yield event, that makes a lot of sense that y'all are first year students. Um, and we're really excited that you are joining in this event early in your career so that um, you, know, you can really plan intentionally and thoughtfully for um, fitting study abroad into your, your academic plans. Um, 
What's really awesome, though, is that you can study abroad at any point throughout your academic career in the summer, for a semester, for a year long program, even the summer after you graduate um, and walk at commencement. So there are lots of opportunities to fit it into your academic plan. Um, and we're excited to share more about that. So next question, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the words study abroad? getting a lot of great responses, learning different languages and cultures. I saw that come up quite a bit in the chat as well. Um, traveling, living in a new country, experiencing different things. Good food, I can certainly attest to great food and um, being able to try different types of cuisine. Adventure, culture. Awesome. Great. I think I might have seen expensive come up as well. Um, that is certainly a, a common myth of study abroad. Um, we have hundreds of programs available here at UC Berkeley. And in some cases, um, it, it may even be cheaper for you to go abroad for a semester or a year than it is to study um, stateside uh, in California and pay Bay Area rent prices, for example. Great. All right, so next question for you all. Um, if you could travel or study anywhere in the world, where would you want to go? And this is an interactive map, so feel free to click anywhere in the world that you are interested in traveling to. It's incredible. We've got folks wanting to go all over the world. We're seeing programs in South America. We do have programs in the domestic US as well. I know that doesn't naturally come to mind when you think of study abroad. Uh, we do have programs within the domestic US. Um, looks like we've got folks wanting to go to different islands, Myanmar, Syria, Scandinavia. Great. All right. So these next set of questions, you'll have 10 seconds to answer them and be warned that uh, the faster you respond, the higher your, your point total will be. Uh, and I know this, this slide says uh, this is co a competition for a prize. Um, when we are back in person, feel free to come find us at the study abroad office. Um, we absolutely will still honor um, the winner for this, uh, this little competition. So you all ready? Got your fingers ready to go? All right. How many countries do we have study abroad programs in? Turn to 20, 20 to 30. See, folks, get it right. Forty percent, seven percent of y'all got it right. Uh, the correct answer is forty to fifty. So we've got so many programs to Ooh. choose from. Uh, that's probably the hardest decision that you'll make is which program to choose. Um, but the the biggest takeaway here, I think, is that whether you want to study abroad and do a traditional exchange program, a language program, whether you want to meet your academic requirements abroad, intern abroad, do research abroad. There is a program out there that exists. Um, and we even have independent programs which allow you to kind of craft and create your own program as well. And just to chime in um, on the, as a Berkeley student, you would have access to over, I think over 250 different individual programs in those 40 to 50 um, locations. 
All right, let's check out the leaderboard. Alicia is, is taking the lead, tie in with quite a few folks. So let's see if we could break that tie with the next question. Do you have to be a junior to study abroad? Yes, no, maybe. We may have given the answer away already earlier in the presentation. So folks were paying attention. So most folks answered no, that is correct. Uh, you do not have to be a junior to study abroad. You can study abroad as early as the summer after your freshman year in college um, and as late as the summer after you graduate. And um, just seeing a couple of questions in the chat about that, um, in terms of when we would recommend, it really depends on each student. Um, so it depends on you and what major you are, what academic plan you have. And so we'd say once you're, you know, um, ready to commit to Cal and coming, like come talk to us in our office and we'd work with you to figure out when would be right for you. Students sometimes study abroad multiple times. Um, so there's a lot of different configurations that may work. All right, y'all are too smart. We have a ton of people in first place tied with 2000 points. All right, the next question, you need a 3.0 GPA or higher to apply. True or false? All right, and the answer is false. That's correct. 44% um, of you all got it correct. Uh, many of our programs have a 2.0 GPA minimum to apply. And even so, we know that GPA isn't everything. So if you are close to that, um, that uh, re lower requirement, let us know, come talk to us um, and we'll, we'll certainly work with you. Anything else to add, Alex? Sweet, all right. Let's check out the leaderboard. Oh, we've got a few people that pulled in, in the lead. Jessica, Kylie, Naya, and guest 183. Very mysterious. Um, Y'all are the top four. Um, so let's see if we can break that tie even further. Next question. Studying abroad is more expensive than an equivalent semester or summer. True, false, or depends on the program. All right, depends on the program. That is the correct answer. So 74% of y'all got that correct. It does depend on the program. There are some programs, as I mentioned before, that are um, significantly cheaper than spending your semester or year here at Cal. Um, Alex, for example, studied abroad for an entire year uh, and it was more affordable for him to go abroad for an entire year than being at Cal. Yeah, that said, there are some locations that it may also be slightly more expensive, um, particularly London um, is one of those places just because the cost of living is so high there. Um, but we like to put this slide in to dispel that myth that um, financial aid or that study abroad is not accessible um, financially because there are program options um, out there that are, um, you know, that are going to be the same or, or cheaper as well. Let's check out our leaderboard. Jessica and Kylie pulled into tie for first place. Guess 183 and guess 494 are in second place. All right, this next question. Financial aid travels with you for UCEAP, Berkeley, Summer Abroad, and Berkeley Global Internships programs. True or false? So the answer is true, 93% of y'all got that correct. Um, that is absolutely true. So if you are financial aid eligible, you can be packaged for all of our programs um, to be able to apply those funds to your, um, your program costs. Um, you can be packaged for housing, cost of living, travel expenses. Um, so that is all factored into your financial aid.
All right, Jessica and Kylie are holding it down in first place. Y'all haven't gotten any question wrong, it looks like. That's awesome. All right, next question. Which of these student photos was taken in Ireland? This might help break the tie. So we'll have to act fast. Only five seconds left to lock in your answer. All right, and the correct answer was the third photo. That was the, the student photo taken in Ireland. Every year, we do have a Berkeley Study Abroad photo contest. So for those of you that do like to capture your memories, we have several categories um, and really beautiful content online as well that you can check out on our Flickr page. All right, let's see who was the winner. Guest 494 pulled into the lead. Mysterious guest 494. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, Isabella. <laughs> Feel free to come find us um, at the study abroad office um, to accept and collect your prize once we are back in person. It's, it'll be something to look forward to, um, to come find us on campus in Stevens Hall. Congrats to you. All right, now to dive into our presentation, this is a quick uh, bird's eye overview of what we will cover today. Uh, we're first going to cover how do you choose a program um, and what does a social justice and study abroad program even mean and how do you know if um, our programs as you're looking at the hundreds of programs available for our students how do you know if it's rooted in social justice so Alex will drop some knowledge for us there um, we will also have a program spotlight so we've pulled um, specific programs that really fall into the social justice and study abroad category um, and we'll highlight those for you all today. And then we'll close with some financial aid and scholarship resources and some next steps to get you started on the planning process. But as we go along, this is um, you know, an informal presentation. We're here to share um, these opportunities with you all. So please feel free to continue entering questions into the chat and we'll answer them as we go. All right, now in terms of breaking it down, um, uh, let me see. Um, so we wanted to actually, instead of telling you, uh, we wanted to show you what a social justice and study abroad program could look like. Um, so we'll just play a quick video to start. Excuse me, sorry. Tech. The word discovery doesn't sit well with anybody who knows anything about the history of the world. And yet people flock here to this monument, unaware or uncaring about its fascist dimensions, unaware or uncaring about the compass rose that sits behind it that was a gift of the apartheid government of South Africa to the fascist government of Portugal in the mid-1960s. Can we try to re-describe this world that has been described in these particular ways in this tourist location with this monument and this pavement? So as you saw in the video, um, social justice and study abroad provides a critical intercultural learning experience that really allows you to think about the systemic and often unequal state of our world um, and the society that we live in. Um, so this video was an example of um, pot a potential site visit or experience that you may have on a social justice and study abroad program. Um, and likely after this type of visit, the instructor would hold a discussion about um, the common narratives behind this particular monument um, and challenging the assumptions that uh, travelers may have um, in Portugal. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to mention about this, Alex? All right, sweet. And we'll move on to the next slide and I'll pass it over to my colleague. Awesome. So as had had mentioned, you know, there's um, there are a lot of different types of uh, programs that are available to you to study abroad. And oftentimes when we travel, 
um, there may not be, a, you know, one of the things that you, you saw in that video is there may not be a critical engagement with, you know, what is really going on here when we go and visit certain places? Um, what are the, the um, interplays of power and privilege that might be at play? Um, uh, you know, what are, what are the dynamics and, and um, you know, how are communities impacted in certain locations and how are they organizing? All these kinds of questions. Often when we travel, we don't have um, access um, to be able to, um, or, or for, you know, we're not able to, to kind of tune into, you know, what's happening um, on the ground. And so one of the great things about study, studying abroad in a program that's rooted in social justice is that it, it, um, they provide frameworks and they're really um, designed to take a deeper look at what's happening in a particular place. Um, but that said too, even if you um, aren't on a program that is explicitly a social justice program, there's definitely ways, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that, um, to, to have a, program, a, a experience that's rooted in your values. So um, when I studied abroad and when Brianna and I met um, while we were studying abroad, um, we weren't necessarily in a program that was explicitly rooted in um, social justice. It was a language immersion program in Chinese. And um, for both of us, it was a bit of a homelands trip. Um, I'm uh, Chinese, Chinese Filipino and Jewish and um, was learning Chinese language and wanting to reconnect with um, that aspect of my culture. Um, and I also had questions coming up as a queer student. Um, you know, is it, what's it gonna be like for me to study abroad and all these kinds of things. And um, there were different ways that I was able to find um, community and then also um, to learn more about a lot of the things that I wanted to learn about. Um, and I'll kind of talk about that in a minute. But um, how to find a program that's rooted in social justice, um, like three, three kind of buckets that you can look at our program that will kind of give some examples of our programs that one, either name systems of power and privilege um, in the host location. So um, the, for example, the questions might be, does this program offer an opportunity to critically examine how power and privilege function in the local context and expose students to ways in which structural inequality is confronted there by local communities. And then the second bucket would be um, a decolo decolonial pedagogy and approach. So um, pedagogy meaning the way that um, uh, things are taught and decolonial um, can mean a lot of different things, um, but um, we're, uh, we're looking at the definition of decolonial as a way of looking at knowledge from the perspective of communities of color, of indigenous communities, um, and not from a um, a mainstream or, or a hegemonic lens, so a lens that is imposed by white supremacy, for example. And so um, the, que the questions that we ask for those programs are, does this program decolonize sources of knowledge creation and the di distribution of learning? Whose knowledge and from what perspectives are, are, are the, is the knowledge centered? And then the last uh, bucket is a critical empowerment framework. So do these program, does this program offer a, a critical way um, of teaching that builds off of the strength of students, supports students in self-reflecting and examining their own identities and exposes them to systems of oppression while giving them tools to confront um, and organize to um, dismantle systems of oppression? So that was a lot of information, <laughs> um, but those are kind of the, the buckets that we are looking at of different types of programs. And feel free um, to put any questions that might come up in the chat as well, um, questions or, or reflections. So um, to go into some of the, you know, specific programs that we recommend um, or so that are examples, and, and keep in mind that th this isn't comprehensive. These are just, you know, some of the examples that we wanted to highlight. Um, so is the UCEAP France um, program, which is a spring program, um, and the the way one of the ways that this program works um, in terms of naming um, power and privilege and confronting is that so this program's title is confronting injustice youth protest movements in France. Um, there, there are classes that you can take, for example, on social justice and activism in French cinema. Cinema. Um, there are classes on the construction of citizenship, um, identity, and the other. Um, you can take classes on France and the Muslim world and the Muslim world in France, um, global food politics, um, social movements in France. So these, this program really dives into what are the social structures at play in France and, and what's really going on. Um, another great uh, program that's available to folks is the Summer Abroad um, Brazil program, 
which is focused on Afro-feminism, dance, and Brazil. And one of the awesome things about this program and, and why we put this in the category of a program that really dives deep into um, naming power and privilege is that the first part of the workshop is actually an undoing racism seminar for two weeks with um, the People's Institute. Um, and the People's Institute is an amazing training program and, and they go in uh, with students and there's actually both American students and Brazilian students in this cohort. And you get to unpack together, what does racism look like in the US? What does racism look like in Brazil? Um, and find shared understandings of how does power and privilege work um, differently, but also similarly. And what tools can we build to undo racism in both places? Um, and then another uh, example of a program, which this year is actually a virtual program, is um, El Otro Lado, which is a comparative look at migration and refugees along the Mediterranean and US-Mexico borderlands. Um, so this program is a, as I said, is a, um, is a virtual program. So it's happening online. Um, but in future years, um, there will also be uh, an in-person component. And um, this one goes into like uh, understanding why countries could create narratives around immigration. Um, and also you get to meet directly with activists and uh, migrant organizations, both in Barcelona and along the US-Mexico border. Um, and so both this program really addresses um, how structural inequality is created. So those are some examples of programs that really name systems of power and privilege. Um, so the next um, kind of program bucket um, are programs that have a, a decolonial approach. And so again, this, this asks kind of, you know, does the program decolonize sources of knowledge, uh, knowledge creation and the distribution of learning? So um, one of the program opportunities that's available in, in this bucket um, is uh, the, our program to Argentina um, and Chile in the fall semester. And this program is really focused on human rights and cultural memory. Um, and one of the reasons that we put it in this bucket is because it's very community focused. So you're meeting on the ground with community rights, with human rights organizations, with former political prisoners, um, with folks that you know, um, have been on the ground doing social justice work um, in those locations. It's a really wonderful program. Um, another example of a, um, so, um, a, a program it, that is, has a decolonial approach is um, our summer abroad program to the Philippines. And generally this is an in-person program this summer because of COVID-19, it's, it's a virtual, but um, this program is really focused on learning directly from um, communities in the Philippines. You actually get to travel um, out to the Cordillera mountain region um, to meet directly with tribes um, in the Philippines that are working on land rights issues that are um, reclaiming cultural traditions or perpetuating cultural traditions. Um, you're also gonna get to meet um, you know, uh, uh, with urban poor communities um, and folk labor, labor organizers in the Philippines, also musicians, artists, activists, scholars, um, uh, directly from community um, folks. Um, and so the, that's a, a program that really has that that um, focus. And yes, to answer your uh, question, um, uh, so not all program, uh, not all study abroad programs are explicitly rooted in social justice. There are programs, for example, that may be, so the program that I took was um, Chinese language. Um, so that was um, a focus really in, um, you know, language immersion and gaining language skills that didn't necessarily have, um, you know, an explicit social justice focus. Um, but I'll kind of talk about there's ways to to make that um, more, you know, to to find ways to kind of immerse yourself in social justice, even if you're on a program that's more of like a cultural exchange. Um, but we wanted to highlight for you that there are options where the curriculum is going to be really guided um, in helping you dive deep into social justice frameworks um, and from a social justice perspective. Um, and then the last bucket um, here. Um, in terms of an empowerment framework, um, so asking if you know does the um, does the program you know offer uh, support to critically self-reflect your own identities and also um, building skills to um, to organize and address systems of oppression. Um, you know a lot of the programs that we already mentioned, the Brazil program, et cetera, fit into that bucket too. But two new other programs we wanted to highlight. Um, were our leadership in social justice and public policy program, which is actually 
um, joint between Mexico City and Sacramento. And um, that's a year long program that is um, based on building up leadership skills um, to be able to, uh, to be a leader in, social, in public policy. Um, so you'll spend time on the Hill in Sacramento, um, understanding how to build policy. You'll also spend time um, understanding what's going on in Mexico City um, and building uh, critical skills and tools to be able to um, address um, issues from a policy perspective. Um, and then another awesome program that we have is called Education, Gender, and Transfeminist Activism in Mexico City. Um, and this program is focusing in on queer and trans um, organizing and activism that's happening in Mexico City. It's a really exciting um, time for, um, for, the, for uh, trans communities and um, in terms of the organizing that's happening in Mexico City, there's more and more visibility around trans rights. And the professor there is really, um, uh, is really connected in and part of those communities. And so um, they take you around to meet with different activists and organizers. And one of the amazing parts of this program is that um, it has an education focus. And so, um, so for example, this summer, students that are in that program are actually gonna be developing resources um, and plat uh, campaign platforms for a candidate who, uh, a trans uh, candidate who is running for um, a, 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 an office in Mexico City this year. Um, in past years, they've worked with um, community organizations to develop um, educational tools that can be applicable here at Berkeley and then also in Mexico. Um, so that's an example of a program where um, you're learning skills on, on how to community organize, um, as well as having opportunities to connect with different communities as well and learn more potentially about your own identities. Um, so yeah, <laughs> those are some of the um, program buckets just to give some ideas. Um, but we did wanna um, also offer that, um, you know, that just because a program is not necessarily explicitly rooted in social justice doesn't mean that you can't um, have an experience rooted in your values no matter what program you go on. Um, so for example, if you're in a typical, ex so some programs may be set up as an exchange program. So what that means is um, you would go to, let's say um, London School of Economics and you get to kind of choose your classes. So one way that you can do that is to choose classes that are related to social justice topics. So let's say you're in London School of Economics and you wanna learn about, um, I, I'm not, so not, nothing's popping to mind at this moment, but you know, a, a class that's gonna be kind of rooted in, in what you wanna, wanna study. Um, also, language and cultural immersion courses um, can at times be a decolonial process. Um, you know, learning a new language provides you new skills, uh, new ways of thinking. Different languages have different frameworks um, that can influence and root you deeper in social justice work. Um, for me, learning Chinese language and in particular, um, you know, getting to connect um, with my, my heritage through also Tai Chi practice and learning Qigong when I was um, abroad actually gave me all of these new frameworks for thinking about movement building um, and, un and have really inf influenced the way that um, I'm involved in social justice movements um, and in a way that's culturally rooted for me. Um, another thing that you can do is to connect with local organizations and communities um, that do work on the intersections of what you're interested in. Um, so for example, the students um, that go on the um, UC Berkeley Rio program, I, I've talked to students there who have been involved with um, various community organizations that are doing organizing across different issues. So they may not have been in a social justice focused program necessarily, um, but they got involved with the local community and were able to learn a lot about what was going on. Um, and then another way that you can do that is to respectfully um, seek out teachers and cultural practices um, while, by, while being mindful of appropriation. So kind of already um, shared, shared that about um, how it's been a really big gift in my life that during my study abroad uh, program, I was able to start learning Tai Chi and, and Qigong and, and that's had a really big impact on actually my activism. Um, so yeah, um, so open it up. Oh, I'm gonna pass it off now to Brianne. Um, uh, who has a couple uh, more slides to go over in terms of how to study abroad. Um, and then we'll open it up for any questions that students. Thank you so much, Alex, for dropping that knowledge for us and those critical questions to consider as you navigate your program choice. 
Now, in terms of the uh, operational pieces of how do you actually get to studying abroad, um, we understand that finances and financial aid can be a barrier. Um, but we want to dispel that myth um, by letting you all know that financial aid does travel with you. Um, so as long as you are registered for the minimum amount of units to qualify for aid, your aid can, uh, you can be packaged for your living expenses, travel expenses, passport, visa costs, things like that um, for your study abroad program. We do also have specifically trained financial aid counselors that uh, really understand this intersection between financial aid and study abroad. Um, and they are available by appointment right now in this virtual world. So you can reach out to them at travelaid at berkeley.edu. And they are happy to sit with you once you've identified your program choice and map out how much aid you would qualify for, how much out of pocket your program may cost, um, how much loans you would qualify for, things like that. Um, you can also use the financial aid estimator available on your Cal Central account to get kind of a, a, a baseline um, estimate in the meantime um, before you book an appointment with them. We also have the Gilman Scholarship that is available for Pell Grant eligible students. Um, and not to toot our own horn, but UC Berkeley has consistently been one of the top institutions that have um, been granted this award for their students. Um, we've kind of figured out, I think, the science and the, the application process. Um, so we host a ton of Gilman um, application workshops, essay workshops to help you really refine your application and submit the best possible application for the award. Um, this scholarship can grant you up to $5,000 for your program costs. Um, and this year with, um, you know, this transition to the virtual world, the scholarship does also apply to virtual programs. Um, so that is an exciting opportunity for um, students that are Pell Grant eligible. And then lastly, our office um, also awards the Berkeley Study Abroad Scholarship. Um, this is a scholarship that will automatically be granted to you if you are eligible. Um, and the basic eligibility, I believe, is if you have an EFC of $50,000 or less. Um, and there's no additional application that's required for this scholarship if you apply to one of our eligible programs, which is Berkeley Summer Abroad or Berkeley Global Internships. Um, this, if you, are, if you qualify for that scholarship, it'll automatically be applied to your account. You'll automatically be awarded that scholarship. For the EAP programs, I believe they have a similar scholarship. I'm blanking on the name of it, but they do have a similar scholarship as well. Um, on our website, we also have a, an entire scholarship resource page, um, depending on your program, your academic um, course study, um, your various identities. There is and always is scholarship money out there. It does sometimes take a little bit of work to find the right opportunity to apply for and submit those applications. Um, but come talk to us if uh, cost is a concern for you. And then in terms of next steps and resources, um, if you are convinced you're ready to sign up um, and go abroad, we would recommend that you start early. Um, it is important to meet with your college and major advisor to figure out how can this fit into your academic plan. Um, sometimes it does take um, a few meetings with your college and major advisor, with our study abroad advising team as well, um, to ensure that um, you, know, you can meet your requirements and still graduate on time. Um, we also recommend that you attend a, a virtual drop-in session. We have our advising schedule linked there. Um, and then if I could ask Alex to drop that in the chat for folks as well, um, you can find um, on this resource all of our contact information. So you can, if you are still maybe just exploring, trying to get a feel for what programs are out there, um, you can set up a, an appointment either a drop-in or a one-in-one -in -one appointment with our peer advisors, which are um, students just like you that have gone abroad where you can get kind of some unfiltered advice um, from, from a peer, um, or you can set up a one-on-one -on -one appointment with any of the um, staff advisors to help you start your planning process. 
We also recommend that you schedule financial aid advising. Um, that can be a, a barrier for folks, um, but not if you plan early and talk to our financial aid counselors. They are ready and willing to help you uh, map out um, how to finance your programs. But if you have more general questions, feel free to just reach out to us at studyabroad at berkeley.edu. Um, if you don't know where to start, that's okay. Um, let us know and we'll help direct you to the right person um, to talk to from there. Okay. So we've reached the end of our slide deck. So we'll open it up now for questions um, or if Alex, you have anything else to add, but we have a couple of QR codes on the screen. One is for the virtual advising guide that has, as I mentioned, all the links to how to, how to contact our staff, uh, where to go for questions. Um, and then on the other side of the screen is our BSA newsletter. So we do send out program updates, program highlights, scholarship opportunities, event updates. Um, we promise not to spam you too much, but if you are interested in signing up for our newsletter, please do so there as well. Awesome. So there are, I am seeing a, a fair amount of questions um, popping up on the chat. So um, I'm going to kind of dive into a couple of the, the questions. Um, also, thank you um, for, you know, bearing with us with all the information that we um, gave to you. Um, we know you, you may be at various, you know, stages and you're kind of feeling out um, what your, your various decisions. So um, really what we just want to let you know is that there's a lot of opportunities. Um, and that there's a lot of support for you um, to, to help figure out. Um, but we're really excited for you, no matter kind of what decisions that, that you make. Um, and there's, yeah, um, it's a really exciting time. So um, we're here to support and reach out also anytime if you have questions. Um, and so a couple of things that wanted to, to the questions wanted to dive into. Um, so do needs-based or regents transfer automatically? So um, it's hard for us to know specifically um, for Brianne and I, because we're not um, financial aid advisors. Um, so if you did want to reach out, that would be a great question for the financial aid advisors. But what we can say is that um, you will be packaged depending on your individual um, EFC. So for any student who is financial aid eligible generally for Berkeley financial aid, you will get um, an aid package for a, a study abroad program. And it may be, a, a, you know, all grants and scholarships, or it may be some grants and scholarships and some loans, that kind of depends on what your package is. Um, but once you um, find out what your package is, it will be um, applied automatically. So you don't have to worry about like filling out an additional thing other than your, um, what you've already filled, would be filling out for FAFSA. Um, and then there are definitely, um, so financial aid is not only for Pell Grant eligible students, um, financial aid is for, you know, a spectrum. Um, just to clarify, the, the scholar, specifically the thing that was only for Pell eligible students was the Gilman scholarship. And that's a specific scholarship that's a nationwide scholarship that's like a nationwide application. Um, so, and that's the one that's Pell Grant eligible, but our general financial aid at Berkeley um, is available for students, whether they're Pell Grant eligible um, or not, there's, there's a spectrum there. Um, how many years can you study abroad? Um, that is hard to, for us to say because it depends on you. Um, I've seen people study abroad uh, like uh, once five times, which was not necessarily something I'd recommend because um, you all, it's also, there's great resources at Berkeley too. Um, but if, um, you know, for that student, it was great. You know, it really depends on you. Um, I've also seen folks just study abroad for one summer and have a great experience. Brianne, do you have anything to add to that for how many years can you study abroad? Um, yeah, you can study abroad really every year if you wanted to. Um, I've worked with a global internship student that participated three summers in a row in three different countries and got three different internship experiences. Um, so it really does depend on you and your planning um, and, you know, kind of the, the Tetris game that you'll have to play in terms of meeting your requirements and um, finding programs that fit those requirements. Absolutely. Um, so um, there, so we'll, uh, let's see. Uh, so, what, okay, just to go up. So summer abroad, study abroad is not just summer. Um, we have summer programs, we have fall programs, spring programs, we have year long programs. There's all sorts of different lengths. 
uh, depending. Um, you are definitely eligible if you're out of state. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that summer for our summer programs specifically, um, our summer study abroad programs are in-state tuition for any Berkeley student. So that might be a good um, fit for you um, if you are out of state. Um, but um, don't limit yourself to just looking at the summer programs because um, there may be fall and spring programs that are, are you know, um, equally affordable for you. Um, would there be any fully funded study abroad research opportunity as you I would say yeah. also, sorry to oh, interrupt. Yeah. I would say also yeah, for, for out-of-state students, um, you could also consider looking at independent programs because if you are not qualifying for financial aid, um, independent programs may be more affordable for you because you would just pay that program fee. Um, but come That's talk to us and we can help direct you to the right person. And Brian, do you wanna um, ad address the research opportunities? Oh, yes. Um, let's see what was there. Are there any fully funded study abroad research opportunities as you gain in years? It's possible um, through the Global Internships Program, there are research opportunities and research positions. Um, that program does still have a program fee and courses attached to it. Um, so it wouldn't be fully funded in that sense. Um, you could be um, packaged for your financial aid where you would uh, have your program fees and tuition covered, um, but it wouldn't be a traditional fully funded research opportunity. Um, there are also research programs through UCEAP that are semester and year long programs. Um, and again, those do have program fees attached to them. Um, you can search for your own independent research opportunities as well. Um, and that is something that I would say is possible if you are already doing a program and abroad and then you're looking for internships on your own, research opportunities on your own and not having to pay that program fee um, that's attached to that, if that makes sense. Awesome. And, and sometimes things pop up like in your department too. Sometimes there are mm -hmm. things that will pop up. Um, it, yeah, uh, I would say, it, especially if you are looking for research opportunities, if you have a faculty member that you really connect with here on campus at UC Berkeley, our faculty has really expansive networks. They may be able to connect you to one of their colleagues abroad. Um, so I would say that's also another great way to be able to kind of navigate that, that path. Absolutely. Um, and also, uh, so for engineering students, um, Brianne, do you want to talk about that? I can chime in too a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So there are programs for engineering students. Um, on our website, I believe under the academics tab, um, there are different departments and units that um, post um, example course plans. I know engineering was one that has worked on um, example academic plans for your four years and uh, where study abroad can fit into it. Um, it also does depend on what type of requirements you're looking for. Um, are you looking to do a, you know, some sort of um, engineering internship abroad? Then you may want to apply through the Global Internships Program. Are you looking to meet some of your um, uh, general requirements for your engineering courses? Um, then you can start your search by looking for um, how to meet those requirements. So it does really depend on what is really drawing you to uh, finding a program, whether it's location-based, the requirements, the type of experience, um, but it is absolutely possible. And there are plenty of programs that would meet the needs for engineering students. Awesome. So the next question I'm seeing, um, does the program you choose to study abroad have to follow the path of your intended major? So um, no. Um, it doesn't. Um, I was an ethnic studies major at Cal um, and I studied mostly in Chinese language um, I, it, when I was studying abroad for the whole year. Um, I did take some film courses and some other courses as well um, that didn't transfer to my major. Um, so, but that will depend on, you know, what your path is. I have a friend who was a triple major. She was very ambitious in that way and, and did it. And so when she was studying abroad, she did have to you know, take only major courses because she was trying to fit in three majors. Um, it may also be different if you are in a, you know, um, uh, pre-med or IB, you know, there's certain majors that things might be a little bit tighter. Um, so, but that's something we can um, help you kind of talk through in the office too, um, if you're, if you have questions. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and your study abroad program may also change your major or change your yeah. academic path as well. Um, I, I took uh, participate in the same program as Alex um, and then ended up minoring in Chinese studies because I had so many credits from my study abroad experience. So um, that's also a possibility. See, so um, are programs like this unique to Cal or would I be able to access these if I end up going to another university? So our UC, great question, our UC EAP programs are accessible to only UC students, um, but they're, um, they're system-wide. So if you go to UCLA, if you go to UC Riverside, any UC, you can, ac- you can access the UC EAP programs. Um, for our Berkeley um, study abroad, our summer programs, um, they're actually accessible to any student from any university. Um, it will be, um, the fees are lower if you're a Cal student um, and, or if you're a UC student, than if you're, um, let's say, going to, I don't know, Cornell or something, um, uh, but, but it's still accessible to you. Um, and different universities have their own programs as well that you can look into. Um, almost every university has at least something that they, that is kind of a homegrown program. Um, and, but yeah, we have um, our study abroad and our summer abroad and global internships are kind of specific Cal-based ones that we offer. Mm-hmm. And so if you go to another university and participate in those programs, you will be granted a transcript from UC Berkeley that has the, the list of courses that you participate in through your study abroad program. And then vice versa, say you go to, or you do come to UC Berkeley, you can participate in other UC campus and other um, campus programs as well. UC Davis, for example, has quite a few summer-based programs that our Berkeley students participate in. Awesome, and then I think this um, might be the last question and um, just ping us if there's another one that we missed, but um, the question is, um, while this is subjective in your experience, have you seen Berkeley extend this focus on critical thought and social justice to their on-campus programs and curriculum? Um, so that's an awesome question. <laughs> um, I am, I, I can take that a little bit because I'm uh, also a Berkeley alum and then Ram, f- feel free to jump in um, too on your experience. Um, what I would say is that, um, I, and I think you'll find this to be true anywhere. Um, the, my candid answer would be that it really depends on the, the professor um, and it depends on the department. Um, I, as an ethnic studies major, being at Cal really did um, change my life. Um, it was um, allowed me, it, it gave me frameworks and tools um, to be able to dive deeper in organizing, understanding myself and the world. Um, a lot of that also, though, was things that I learned through community organizing, through camp, off, through my community organizations on campus. Um, some of it was in the classroom, some of it was outside of the classroom. Um, and I think there's a range of, um, of curriculum that you'll find that's really engaged, um, that is really critical, and is going to be really helpful in fostering um, your, the frameworks that you're looking for. And then you'll also find other classes that, that may feel very challenging for you and you won't resonate with. And those are also really valuable um, because they kind of introduce you to different frameworks that you will be encountering and will give you, uh, you know, the opportunity to develop skills to kind of think, okay, how do I address that way of thinking? Um, you know, how do, you know, what, if I encounter that in the world, like how do, how do I counter that? Um, so um, that would be my, you know, candid answer would be it's a mix. Um, but even though it's a mix, I was um, really lucky and able to find um, pockets on campus that really did support me in my growth um, and, and, and also um, the, the ability to dive deeper into learning about social justice. Like there's definitely a lot of amazing folks here at, at Berkeley. Um, and there's also gonna, you know, gonna be situations where um, you know, the focus isn't on social justice. Um, so it's kind of a microcosm of the world at, at large in that way. Um, but there's great, great people here that, that you can learn from and, and um, yeah. So. All right, so we're coming up on uh, two minutes left in the session. So if there are any last minute burning questions, feel free to either shout them out or drop them in the chat. Um, I know there were a lot of questions about the recording in the chat as well. Um, this will this is being recorded currently. Um, it will take our team a little bit of time to 
um, edit it and get it in a, in a packageable format and upload it to our YouTube uh, site. So it will be on the Berkeley Study Abroad YouTube channel eventually. Um, it will also be, I believe, in your map at Berkeley accounts and linked there and available for you to watch. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us. We are excited uh, for the potential of you all coming to Cal. Congratulations, and we hope to meet you all in person soon. And to our winner, come find us on campus. Uh, we do still have that uh, prize for you available. All right, awesome. thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Great to meet you all. Take care.